And finally, uh, Ali Hamed, uh, a, a VC at CoVenture, um, who I think is getting mic'd up right now. Here we go. Uh, and talk about uh, back to the money end of New York. Ali. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. So you have a very interesting story, um, and I hate it when other people try to tell stories, so why don't you tell your own story? Um, which part? Just uh, kind of from, from youth up. And... Yeah. Well, from, from, from youth up and then... Sure. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Southern California, uh, peaked really hard at 16. Um, <laughs> I was an All-American baseball player, and uh, so it's all sort of downhill from there. All my baseball friends now think I'm an IT guy at Best Buy at this point. <laughs> Um, and fractured my back in two places in college, realized playing Pac-10 baseball was a lot harder than playing Ivy League baseball. I wanted to go beat up on a bunch of nerds, so I figured I'd go to Cornell. Um, and when I got there, IBM had just come out with software development kit for Watson, so we built an NLP engine that could identify motion sentiment news articles. We licensed it to traders that could trade things like commodities on sentiment analysis. And um, kind of an interesting experience, built the business, grew to about 30 people, and then um, ended up running out of money, as some businesses do. Um, and which is why I'm not on a beach somewhere. Um, and after that point, I just started doing consulting. Um, I would go find clients, and I was an expert in whatever they needed. I'd subcontract out the work of people, to people who actually didn't know what they were doing. I'd just sort of learn from them and become like the partner on the job. Um, at the time, I remember like one of my bigger clients ended up firing me because I was charging too little, and they realized I was like a 19-year-old in college um, <laughs> as a sole proprietor, like the first time they got an invoice. <laughs> And I was thinking, like, wow, $100 an hour, this is really great, <laughs> uh, which is not what BCG charges. So um, anyway, so I was doing consulting for a bit. It's a little bit soul-crushing, and I wanted to start angel investing, and I realized that venture capital in general is um, you know, pretty messed up. So if you think about how seed investing traditionally works, basically you take what a Series A fund does, and the seed fund strategy is let's raise less money and hire less people, and that's like our strategy for a new type of investing. Um, and people would give me basis points if I wrote, you know, a twenty thousand dollar check into a business, which is really all the like, capacity I had at the time. Um, and, and but they'd give me like five, ten points if we just coded their app. And I realized it was actually easier to raise capital than it was to find good software developers. Um, <laughs> and so there was an arv in that. Um, the other part is we didn't really know any of the VCs who could code. So you had like a bunch of non-technical people investing in technology businesses. Mm -hmm. When um, at that point, the biggest risk is will you build it, right? So if you think about most VC firms, they want to invest post-product because they want to mitigate execution risk. And their way of uh, mitigating technical risk and execution risk is going to find a couple kids at Google or Palantir who know how to code but don't know anything about healthcare. Right, so there's technical risk and market risk, and so they mitigate technical risk because they know how to do diligence on market risk and not on technical risk. Like their strategy for technical diligence is finding some CTO in their portfolio who's probably like out to lunch and being like, "Hey, do you mind talking to the founders of this company and seeing if they're actually going to build?" Make this sure thing. they're using the right vocabulary. Right? Well, yeah, and, and yeah. you know the CTO is probably sitting there and like, "I don't know what the hell I'm doing." Like, why yeah. are you asking me? Yeah. Um, I'm not getting paid for this, and so it's just crazy that that's how it works. The other thing that's nuts is you have all these founders who find some kid who can code and call that person CTO. And like being a CTO and coding an app are sort of two different jobs, mm -hmm. which is like sort of this mind-blowing thing to a lot of people. If you ask most VCs to define a product manager versus a project manager, they might not know what that is. Yep. They yep. might yep. not know the difference between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, right? Right. Which is like really scary that people give them money. Um, and so, so I figured like the, the, the bar for being a good manager of a seed fund was really low. And so that was sort of where we entered. Um, and then over time, and we started building software for the companies we invested in. So we just invested in very deep domain experts. So we're in a farm lending business founded by a former farmer, you know, warranty claims business, you know, like things that are a little esoteric and outside of traditional venture capital. Um, and we also started a fund that buys securities on, uh, from alternative lending platforms. So these are platforms like not Lending Club, but businesses like Lending Club. Um, so, you know, the, I kind of gave you a lot there, but the overall thesis is venture capital as an asset class is really built to support a homogenous group of founders who are, built, who are all solving, solving everyone else's problems. So if you go to the Valley, and like a lot of my best friends live there, but if you go there, it's like this feeling of, hey, we're all really smart here. We're all very efficient and like do things the right way, and we should be our own country, even that's how good we are. Um, <laughs> let's go build apps and solve other people's problems, right? Mm -hmm. And these companies are sort of built from this place of judgment at their core. But if you let mm. domain experts solve their own problems, they're built with empathy at their core. And there's a little bit more of a nuanced understanding mm. of um, what those people need. And the founders that will build those companies are a little bit more diverse. And so we're hoping that it's not a bunch of idiots like me building every company that exists in the future. Mm -hmm. We want them to come from a, a, a much more diverse subset of backgrounds. Um, and so that's more And you're in New York. Yeah. So why, why did you choose New York? Um, so uh, 
Probably you get a little bit of ne negative selection bias if you can't find a technical co-founder in San Francisco or Boston because there's mm -hmm. so many engineers. I think that, you know, the greatest part about living in New York is how diverse people are, right? Whether it's, you know, from a socioeconomic standpoint, race, um, religion, to what industry you're in, yeah. right? Like, that's the cool part, right? Um, I live in Brooklyn, which is becoming less uh, diverse. My partners are convinced I live in the ghetto because I live in Williamsburg. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and because of that, you can sort of take technology and sort of put it in industries uh, that have traditionally not had it. Entrepreneurship is a cross-disciplinary exercise, right? The greatest things happen when you take one knowledge set and, and combine it with a, another knowledge set, uh, knowledge set that traditionally don't cross poll pollinate. Well, this is the point you were making that, that New York is the and. The argument we right. have here, it's an and. That, right. that it's technology and journalism yeah, and, and, and finance. What were some of the companies? Commercial real estate, uh, children's media, uh, you know, just a real range of some of the ones that we were looking at, talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fashion, that's what's so cool about it. Types. Yeah, I'm clearly not a, an expert in fashion. Um, yeah. but we've you're, invested, you're a good company. Uh, yeah, but we've invested in a couple of uh, beauty businesses and the diligence on my end takes a little bit longer <laughs> than, say, like an alternative funding platform. Uh, technology and beauty? Uh, yeah. You know, I think that, um, look, beauty has uh, traditionally focused on one type of person, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're investing in a business called Trace Noir, and it uh, is in-home hairstyling for minority women, right? Um, different races have different hairstyles um, and hair types. Um, and traditionally, most salons don't know how to deal with that. If you're an African-American woman living in Manhattan, it's very hard to find someone who can style your hair. Right. Um, you can imagine my diligence process was a little wonky on that, right? A lot of walking to hair salons. Um, and I clearly was not the target demographic. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you, we're starting to see a bunch of plus-size e-commerce brands. Um, mm -hmm. We've looked on diligence on a few and haven't gotten there on any yet. Um, but it's probably going to happen. You know, Gwynny B is a really interesting business. Um, so, you know, whether it's... That, you know, and, and we also do a lot of pattern recognition looking at industries, so we'll go from beauty to finance. You know, um, I started watching TV recently. TV is freaking awesome. It is so much easier than reading. Um, <laughs> and what we realize is uh, lending works the same as Netflix, right? So Netflix was a customer acquisition tool. Eventually started underwriting customers, figure out what they wanted to watch, and then started producing their own shows. Lending, like Lending Club is a toothpaste business, right? It's just a brand. You recognize it, and you acquire customers using this brand and like a better UX. But like Innovation 2.0 in lending is probably underwriting customers better and figuring mm -hmm. out, you know, we're in one business. Risk management. Mm -hmm. Risk management. Like we're in a business that, um, you know, it gives scheduling software to employers. Um, and those employers, uh, you know, use that to figure out when they're, you know, imagine a Pret employee is going to come into work. And then they, uh, they pay the company every two weeks. And the company tells the employees they can take their paycheck any day of the week they want. And what it does is it's arming the credit risk of subprime borrower and replacing payday lending with it by um, assessing the credit risk of their employer, mm -hmm. right? Like that's a lot more interesting than just being a better user experience. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, uh, and then the next part is they're going to have like more interesting ways to lower the cost of capital, just like Netflix produces its own shows, right? So whether they set up a BDC and MLP or come up with some, go out to retail investors because retail investors have a lower cost of capital than family office or whatever it might be. Um, and so that's sort of how we, because we're not very smart people, so we have to use pattern recognition to figure out what makes sense in an industry. And so that's our way of thinking about industries. So Justin runs a lab where bright young people come in and want to start new things and try new things and build them. I uh, started a program here in entrepreneurial journalism where we try to mm -hmm. prove it's not an oxymoron sure. and convert communist to capitalist as I'm fond okay. of saying. Yeah. Uh, we well, got to teach them how banks work first. Uh, right? Like I bet you 99% um, of people don't know what return on equity means for a bank. Right, and like a good right. way of uh, converting people from communist to capitalist is being like, you know, this is sort of like what Babel yeah. Perry said about liquidity requirements and shit, like stuff. <laughs> it's the internet. You can say what you like. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, the YouTube uh, uh, screws this over there. Yeah. Um, so, so we're trying to. Yesterday we had our pitch day here, where we had uh, okay. 19 entrepreneurial journalism students presenting their businesses, which Super was cool. which is really cool. Um, and the problem that I have here, I'll be curious to hear Justin's next. The problem I have here is that we can have people see through their good ideas, but they don't have uh, a team to build a prototype to the, with the funding. Yeah. Uh, they're isolated as journalists, and, 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 and everybody needs technologists, and there's not enough technologists in the world. The ones who are there are snotty and difficult. and, and uh, Yeah, we're uh, the worst. Uh, right. So Because you can be, because everybody wants you. Everybody I, think, loves I think it's you. because most people who are engineers like spend their whole life not being cool, and suddenly they're cool. <laughs> and they're like, this Take is awesome. That. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. What about you? What, what's your biggest challenge? Um, well, I, I think it's interesting. I, I'd be interested to, to know some of the, the sort of technology areas that you think are the, the ripest to be applied across those various. Uh, I mean, you were into NLP, for instance. We see a lot of people working on uh, NLP and other data sciences. Kind of, you see a lot of computer vision kind of coming along now into, into commercialization. Um, you sure. know, what, are, what are the sort of technologies that are fundamentally you're seeing being applied across many different sectors that you think are ready to, to so, disrupt the markets? So I think, honestly, the, the most interesting stuff is, you know, how do you kind of get, like, so, so, okay, so NLP and machine learning, I think we're still, in a, we're still solving stats problems to solve calculus uh -huh. problems, and I think that we're, like, sort of a long way for that um, being so interesting. I think if you look at a lot of these AI companies, um, someone said uh, mostly automated as a service, and, you know, whatever the acronym is, and I started calling them sort of automated as a service. Sort of automated, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and probably have a lot more to do with people in the Philippines answering questions than, you know, actual machine learning. A lot of Wizard of Oz going on there. Yeah, so... so um, or just simple decision trees. Yeah, and, and by the way, the amount of times people come in and tell us that they're using machine learning, it's really just a rule-based yeah. system, is a little bit um, heartbreaking. We did a project last summer where we tore down various uh, IoT products and, and found that many that sort of suggest they have, uh, you know, machine Machine learning yeah. inside them really don't have. And, and, but that's okay, and I don't think yeah. you need it. And I think, honestly, the stuff that for us is most interesting now, like, I don't think we have mobile apps at a certain point, right? You know how we used to have desktop apps, mm -hmm. and then the browser got pretty badass? Um, and I think that, like, our mobile browsers will get good enough, right? And so I'm pretty bummed that Dolphin never worked out. I'm pretty bummed that a few of these other ones haven't worked out. But I'm pretty sure Chrome will solve that at some point. We'll never have mobile. Like, it is crazy that we actually have mobile apps, just like we had, like, I feel like I'm putting a CD into my phone, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, so things like that, like, um, there's there's a number of, I think everyone will know how to code, but I don't think coding will be the same, right? Coding will probably be a little bit more drag and drop. We're investing in a company called VidCode that's trying to make, basically what they've done is they've built a photo editing tool, but you have to code to use it. And so you have like all these teenagers coding and they don't even realize they're coding. So I think um, in terms of new technologies, AI probably matters, but that's sort of like a computing problem <laughs> as much as it is a algorithm problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm more interested in sort of like things that you'll look at and be like, how did that ever exist like that before? Right. You know, and I think that native mobile apps is probably the one that I think is most offensive still. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean like, you know, things like Ionic are cool, Meteor is cool, and just depends on the communities that get around them. Cool. So do you have any advice for... Advice for the entrepreneurs. For yeah. the entrepreneurs. Advice what should they be justice, pursuing? Um, geniuses? Um, I would say... So the hardest part, especially when, like, and I, I fall into this a lot, right, because you're, when you're young, you, you're supposed to know everything and be really cool, um, is you spend so much time trying to be interesting that you forget to be interested in stuff. Uh -huh. And I think that, like, if you um, just end up, like, sort of being, you, this interesting thing happens when you talk, so when you listen to what they're saying, <laughs> you learn. Um, and you become more organically interesting over time, and you, f you find and you discover problems that are traditionally not um, found by students of a certain you know, age group. And the amount of startups that we see founded to solve the problems of you know, male Caucasian 24-year-olds mm -hmm. is a lot, right. right? Because of the problems that we see. Um, and when you start mm -hmm. finding problems that serve a you know, minority voice that traditionally hasn't been heard before, and by the way, we've all fooled ourselves into thinking they're heard because of digital media, I would say digital media might have created greater socioeconomic yeah. disparity, yeah. right? Because for the Absolutely. first time, readers are not aligned with the writers. The readers are the cost of goods sold that you sell to advertisers and free content, mm -hmm. right? And so the cost of goods sold is acquiring users that you can, but the wealthiest read the New York, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and for, they're the only ones aligned with their readers, right? So for, you know, you have like this, this crazy disparity of minorities still not having their voices heard, even though we all convinced ourselves that they are. We could spend an hour talking about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, we certainly could. So, well, this goes to the other uh, debate that I hear in my world, yeah. which is the debate around scale. That some would say not everything has to scale. That if you're trying to serve a community and you can do it with terrible, ter terribly great efficiency, uh, and 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 really focus in on higher relevance and value to that community, uh, that you don't have to scale to be the gigant the, the, the gigundo thing yeah. you used to have to be. Yeah, that's a probably a an asset class problem at this point, mm -hmm. right? There is mm -hmm. just isn't. Mm -hmm. um, Venture firms aren't structurally built to back exactly those businesses. So right. basically, the best VC firms just became bigger. Um, and so, you know, like if you think about Andreessen Horowitz, they might have owned 10% of Instagram, but they're a billion dollar fund. They've got to return $3 billion to their LPs, and they made $100 million on Instagram, which is a lot, but they have to find 30 Instagrams. That's sort of like a pain, right? Sort of tricky. Um, and so until, but I think what you're starting to see is VC funds are raising different types of funds and becoming closer to asset managers. So like growth funds are in vogue, right, or opportunity funds. 
And I think that you'll also find VC firms eventually start raising, I don't know what they're going to call it, but funds that back opportunities that are in their portfolio. You've invested, but you've discovered that the market isn't as big as you thought it was. And your option is either to have like a fire sale or maybe you do capitalize them out of a different type of fund. And you, your customers, the LPs, are already your customers and you can sell them a new product and get a little bit more AUM. So I think that that'll be solved over time. I, you know, and, and that's our fault for not fixing it yet. Um, and we've kind of screwed on for for it. Well, these yep. crowdfunding uh, equity. Uh, the Jobs Act took oh, finally, I, 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 this week, finally right? took effect yeah. this week. Yeah, I think that a lot of retail investors are going to get screwed, mm -hmm. right? Like, if I could have a thousand retail investors or yeah. like one great LP, I'm not going with a thousand retailers. No. So fact, you're yeah. a, you're you're a naysayer on on that particular front. I mean, look, I think a lot of bad ideas are going to get funded. Um, same, it's going to be the same as Kickstarter campaigns where uh, the product never gets built. Right. Um, so I think, it, or maybe we'll go through the um, what is it the. Uh, Trough of disenchantment. Disillusionment. Yeah. Yeah, disillusionment. Yeah. Where I'm not, yeah, I don't know those big words. Um, but, right, and like yeah. it'll happen, people get screwed, and then eventually it gets a little bit better. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Kickstarter, I mean, the amazing thing has been that um, it's still a, a minority of projects that end up in that in that circumstance. So, yeah. perhaps the crowd on, a, on, on the whole knows better. We'll see. I think that, look, there's opportunity to co invest. So, like, Lending Club is probably the first crowd funder. Right. Right? Like, mm -hmm. you actually have retail investors who aren't getting screwed. Well, tr theoretically, it sounds like Lending Club kind of screwed Jeffries, but um, you know, traditionally not getting screwed and actually getting returned. Mm -hmm. I don't really know any other anyone else who's done crowdfunding like that. Mm -hmm. I think, but all you know, there were some earlier uh, equity crowdfunding platforms that that didn't quite make it to this moment. Um, I think it's Alpha a, Works, and a few. yeah. Um, yeah. But, but there are a couple that, that are still at it. AlphaWorks is, I think, still at it. And this might also solve the problem, though, of going after opportunities that don't scale to the same uh, degree that venture investors scale. So cost of capital of retail investors is traditionally lower than the cost of capital of an asset manager, which is then lower than a, a, a hedge fund, which is then lower than a family office, right? So if you think about what return is required by somebody. Um, and I think that as people realize that alternatives are no longer alternative and they just have to mm -hmm. be in private markets because they can't make money in public markets anymore, whether it's because firms like Two Sigma just make it too efficient, like, or you just you can't compete in public markets. Um, wealth just isn't being created. So I think that people's expectations for what they have to make due to the liquidity and alternative asset class is probably going to come down. And so you can actually generate less returns and still raise more capital into your fund. And retail investors are the greatest example of a low cost of capital. And so maybe that'll be the solution. This um, is better than baseball, isn't it? No, no. Hell no. <laughs> Dude, you get way more girls in baseball. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> A lot more fun to so, play baseball. So one more question. Uh, we're trying to talk about technology in New York. Yeah. And what it's going to take, uh, and, and this is on a network of podcasts that's in, in, in California, so we, we're, we've got a second city syndrome here now in sure. New York. Now. Um, we talked a few weeks ago on the show about what it's going to take for New York to take off in, in greater development of companies. And the argument made I mean, by... our portfolio rocks. Uh, is right, that taking off? Well, that's the question. So there, there were investors who were arguing that we need more great exits in New York. Mm -hmm. What's is New York already there, and we're just not seeing it? Is what does New York need? Sounds like their LPs aren't very happy. They should just be better investors. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, look, you've got firms like First Round who have absolutely knocked out of the park. Union Square has knocked out of the park here. Um, I think that it takes time. I think that um, look, a tech company, you know, so so Silicon Valley is better at building tech companies and New York's better at building tech enabled businesses. Yes. I think tech enabled businesses probably don't have the same opportunity as a tech company because like Google's a utility, right, at this point. Um Palantir has convinced people it's a tech company, it's probably a consulting business. Um, you know, with a little bit of technology. Um but it, it'll happen. You know, Blue Apron is a food business, right? That's sort of a big deal. Food's important. We yep. you know, I eat food, I don't know if you right, yeah. Um yes. yeah, so um I think LA is also a huge opportunity, mm -hmm. um, but I think just by definition, you probably go after vertical markets once you're enabling technology to a vertical. And if you are the technology enabling everything, um, you know you might have a tech-enabled bank at some mm -hmm. point. You mm -hmm. might have like the next Blackstone. Um, and, like I think if Blackstone had been founded in 2014, it would have been founded by a bunch of engineers. Yeah. What does tech-enabled journalism look like in that vision of yours? I mean, media. I, so I think media is absolutely crazy, and I'm sure you do too, but I think that like my kids will look at movies and be like, how the hell did you watch every movie in two hours? Like when I read Shakespeare, I was so annoyed that the story was told within a structure. And now the structure of a story is told because of the story, right? We start sentences with the word and, books are different pages in length, sentences are different amount of words. And movie, like HBO has made it so that we now tell 
create the structure around the story rather than the other way around. I feel totally gypped that Harry Potter wasn't told as an HBO show, <laughs> where the first book would have been eight hours, and the second book would have been ten, and then, you know, and told over many episodes. The other thing that's crazy about HBO and Netflix is that every episode is the same length, right? So, like, when I read mm -hmm. a book, every chapter's in ten pages. It depends on when the subplot ends. Right, so I've noticed that I start watching shows and I end wherever the hell I think the subplot ended, not when like the, some arbitrary forty-minute time block ended. Right. And so I think that um, not that's, to mention it's all two-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and you know I think um, well, so I've read something interesting that I, I hadn't really thought about, which is that when it's two-dimensional, it allows the storyteller to tell you where the focus is. That's right. And if we leave ourselves up to our own devices, like I have ADD, so I'm gonna be like over here while someone's getting murdered, you know. But um, yeah, but it's inevitable, right? That yeah. like we're gonna be in the story and. Maybe we'll be part of it, and maybe we'll be able to design the story. Um, but there's going to be a lot of things that our kids are like, man, your shit sucked. You know? <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. Go back to your, go back to your earlier business, uh, the sentiment analysis in news articles. Yeah. Um, oh, man, it was so rules-based. We called it NLP, and we just, like, waited news articles. Talk how would you it. do that today? Was there, is there value there? Do news articles to actually tell you anything? Would yeah. You, would you, if you did the same, if you brought the same thing to Facebook or Twitter, would it be more valuable? No, I mean, look, there's people who do it a lot better. You know, it was kind of a cool idea in 2000. This is when people, like, thought, didn't know what the cloud was still, right? Yeah. Like, um, at this point, what we were doing is pretty elementary. And Most impressive when I saw was a piece of research uh, by a university professor who was um, literally pulling photos of CEOs from public appearances um, running some computer vision, facial recognition, yeah. uh, emotion recognition algorithms, huh. Huh. and found he was able to predict stock performance well, so based on they're, the, they're, the, they're facial facial <laughs> the facial appearance of the but CEO. Here's what scares the heck out of me about stuff like this, is you become so convinced that you're right because it's an algorithm and you know, blah, 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 and it leaves yourself to the black swan problem, sure. right? Yeah. Which is like... The more convinced that you're right, the less you start thinking about black swans and the greater scale you do it at. And somebody with a better poker face probably gets away with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, and all that yeah. stuff makes yeah. me nervous. But it's because I'm not as smart as those guys are, so mm -hmm. they probably get it more than I do. Um, last question. I think I said that before, but I lie. Uh, your relationship to the VC community in New York. Oh, we're homies. Right. I mean, you all see the same companies. Yeah. Some of them uh, try to hire us to do diligence for them. Tech really? Diligence, yeah. Really? So what is what is that community like now versus uh, the Valley? Um, okay, Oof. this is a long, uh, I'll try to keep it short. The VCs in New York have gotten much better. I think that to start a VC fund, you have to be good at fundraising, not good at investing. And I think the people who are still investing are you know, getting um, better, they're learning. I think though that um, in the Valley, people um, have made their money in tech, so they started as pretty qualified people. In New York, they made their money usually outside of tech and start mm -hmm. funds because they had access to capital. Um, and what you'll see is the people who are really good in New York end up going upstream. They have larger funds and so they're a little bit later stage. And the new funds, like the $20, $40 million funds, they're often backed by people who, you know, this is their first fund. The problem is when they have to raise their next fund, it's only two and a half years, maybe two years from today. And they're not going to have exits. They're not going to have a lot of markups. The only KPI they're going to have is who am I co-investing with? If I'm in a bunch of deals with first round capital, I probably it's like hiring McKinsey. I'm probably doing pretty well. So people become logo hunters, not just in the companies they're trying to invest in, but in the people they're co-investing mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of people who are investing with no conviction. If you are raising, if you are a VC and you don't lead your own deals, what you're basically saying is I'm not good enough at the job that I all have to do all day long to come up with my own opinion. And you're gonna have this crazy regression to the mean. And if you look at how VC firms are structured, the more diversified you see a fund, the smaller checks they write and the more diverse they are, the earlier they are and the dumber they think they are. And the later stage you are is the smarter you think you are, and the, or the bigger the check size and the more concentrated, the later you are and the smarter you think you are. If you look at Founders Fund, Peter Thiel sort of thinks he's smart and he invests like he thinks he's smart. And by the way, he's freaking smart, right? And his performance rocks. And it's a really concentrated portfolio because he's optimizing to thinking, I can actually pick stocks. People who index the venture community are basically saying, I can't pick stocks, I'm not smart enough. And the earlier you are, the less you know, data you have to make that assessment. And I think that probably not enough people are trying to be, um, are investing with conviction and concentrating enough portfolios in New York. And I think that in the Valley, people have a little bit more guts. Jeff and I were at a conference uh, last week um, that had a panel on diversity in venture capital. Mm -hmm. And it largely focused, the title of the, the, the thing was on uh, gender diversity in, in, sure. in venture capital. Um, but the conversation also touched on uh, m diversity more broadly. Yeah. There were folks on the panel from Graycroft and Firstmark, I think. Um, 
Do you think New York's doing anything anything uh, better or worse in that regard uh, than other venture communities? So, so, so it's newer, so it's easier probably to make advances faster, just like mobile banking in Africa, it's new. You don't have all the legacy crap. Mm -hmm. And so when you start something from zero, you can make changes with all the knowledge. And the Valley kind of figured out that it didn't have enough diversity. And New York had the benefit of starting a bit later. And I bet LA actually ends up being more diverse than even New York will be. Um, and so I should preface with, you know, I'm a white male, so how qualified am I to answer this question? Um, but I think that the fact that the industry is a little bit more diverse, the demographic of New York is probably a little bit more diverse, um, we'll have, we have a greater obligation to fight for diversity because we have a better opportunity to make it work. Um, I think our portfolio, we're really proud. We, I think in the last 13 companies, we've backed three Caucasian males. And the reason we think it is is because we don't invest in the you know, traditional type of founder. Um, because of sort of our thesis, and we look for domain experts and people from different industries. Um, so almost by, it's not part of our thesis to back a certain demographic of founder, but it's just happened. But I do think um, New York has a really big obligation. I think LA also has a big obligation, and the Valley needs to figure it out. And I think people, there's enough people working hard at it, not everyone is, um, and it'll take a little bit of time. I think that the encouraging thing is entry-level positions have probably got a little bit more diverse but senior level positions haven't. The easy way out is to say, well, you have to work in this position for a while before you right. become senior. It's probably a little true, but not that true. Mm -hmm. um, so, and if I go any further, I'm just gonna get myself in trouble by saying something sure. stupid, but yeah. you know, we're, we're, it's important. I think that's a watchword for the show right now, because I think we're about out of time. Okay, cool. so, so we'll stop before we say something stupid. Yeah.